This program is brought to you by the Forbes featured Freedom Hub Health Plan, the alternative to overpriced and restrictive insurance. The Freedom Hub Health Plan is exactly what you need. By Frequency Medicine Associates, supporting health professionals and laypersons with safe and effective advanced telemedicine like technology that can scan and help rebalance the root causes of stress and illness. By the Planet Lockdown film, which can be seen on the Freedom Hub's Rumble channel along with many great speakers. And by the Pavilion a 21st century community hub that brings together many of the disruptive innovations featured by the Freedom Hub, including direct pay healthcare, farm to table dining, TED like Freedom Hub talks, and more. Visit your mp.com forward slash pavilion solution for details. Welcome, folks, to uh, Freedom Hub's uh, weekly webinar. For four years, we've been hosting every week except holidays and We'll have a special guest, Professor Deirdre McCloskey, uh, comment. But this is Daniel Klein's show on Adam Smith. And folks are pretty superficial when they think about him, invisible hand. And if you kind of get into liberty thinking, you realize, well, he's got this philosophy book too, The Theory of Moral Sentiments. And when you combine those two things, uh, you start to uh, humanize the cold logic of economics and you get to learn about his friends and all their discourse back in the Enlightenment days and how it influenced our founders and our country. And it's really relevant now because there's a real uh, pushback against some of the wokeism in culture and in the corporations. Um, you know, folks want to kind of re reestablish some conservative traditional values, but they also want to have a liberal policy of openness to kind of keep this American engine of invention going. Uh, so finding that right mix is going to be kind of the goal today. And in researching Professor Klein, I saw an article where he mixed what, what he phrased policy liberals and polity conservatives. And he uh, combined it to, to what Adam Smith would uh, probably, probably say, maybe not, conservative liberalism. And that excites this show because we're always looking for solutions um, you know, we want to expose corruption and chaos, but we also want to have answers. Um, Daniel is a professor at George Mason University. He is the chair of the Smithian Political Economy Program, editor of Econ Journal Watch, the JIN chair of the Mercatus Center, host of NSMithworks.org, I think. Um, it's published in Transit Tolls Emissions Credit Reporting FDA, a favorite of ours. We'll get to that in Q&A. Two of his great articles that will definitely are relevant today, uh, the relationship between liberty, dignity, and responsibility, and then the editor of Reputation Studies in Voluntary Elicitation of Good con Conduct. That's obviously, it, it's important, it, its importance is obvious because if we're going to shrink government, people are going to be scared about chaos. So we have to discover, you know, um, Henry Hazlitt's reputation. Why are these concepts important in society? So take it away, Dan, and then we'll switch it over to Professor McCloskey. Great, thank you, uh, Jim and Charles. I'm honored to be here and I'm honored by Deirdre sitting in. I know Deirdre has to go uh, early, so we're gonna switch over to her after I give uh, some work, some remarks. Yeah, let me, let me say something about um, Smith's liberalism, which I think can be fashioned as conservative liberalism. Uh, but just before that, let me say something about the two great works, Theory of Moral Sentiments and then The Wealth of Nations. They are very much uh, to be understood as part of a whole project. T Theory of Moral Sentiments, or TMS, is very much about your virtue and your conduct. And your conduct includes actually your beliefs and your sentiments and your speech and discourse. Mm -hmm. And it, and in a way, the, the wealth of nations is then turning to the topic of what should our beliefs, sentiments, and discourse about these matters of public policy be. So in a sense, it's about what is virtuous thought or opinion or discourse, and he's helping us, and it's very difficult, of course, it's very uh, non-intuitive or, or and often a non-instinctual uh, to come to the kind of conclusions he comes to about letting you know the spontaneous order 
happens uh, from the bottom up uh, with the invisible hand. And he's educating, he's, he's instructing us morally about our beliefs, discourse, and so on. So it's all, it's all actually nested within theory of moral sentiments, if you will. Think of TMS as the broader umbrella with Wealth of Nations, a kind of topic, a big, big, important, very important topic. There's nothing as powerful and influential as government policy and government institutions and society. So it's a very important thing to get right. So, so what does he say are good views on policy? Generally speaking, and I quote, allowing every man to pursue his own interest, his own way upon the liberal plan of equality, liberty, and justice. It's a very important moment in the wealth of nations. It's one of quite a few which help to christen the word liberal as the name for this basic policy attitude or posture, namely allowing every man to pursue his own interest his own way. Of course, it is within certain uh, constraints and limits. It's upon the liberal plan of justice, which for starters means not messing with other people's stuff. Um, so, and, and you know, the book, that is really the main spine of the book, the main message of the book. It's not axiomatic, it's not 100%. He makes exceptions, but he feels, uh, generally speaking, he shows uh, a lot of compunction about justifying the exceptions. And the exceptions that he does make, by the way, are generally going along or endorsing certain status quo restrictions at the time. He doesn't ever really come out and advocate exceptions that would be new to the situation. Um, so it's very liberal. And I do think that liberalism is, like I say, the spine and sort of the, this is our general direction to lean in, to go forward in our general sort of approach to things. Now, <clears throat> he does not use the expression conservative liberal. In fact, the word conservative uh, was scarcely used in any political way at this time. Um, and the word conservatism doesn't come until like the 1830s, but anyhow, I do think it's fair to say that in many respects, it is a conservative liberalism. So it qualifies, it modifies the liberalism. How so? Um, I think that his approach, and I would extend this to his friends, David Hume and Edmund Burke, his approach is sort of somewhat, I mean, it gives a presumption to liberty just as we've been saying, allowing every man to pursue his own interest his own way. But at the same time, I think any reasonable human being has to give some presumption to the status quo. And I think he does recognize that. And, and, and these two presumptions sometimes join together. That is when they, when someone proposes a new reduction in liberty, a new restriction both liberty and the status quo say, hey, no, you got a big burden of proof to justify that. Both of them say that. But when a reform would augment liberty or liberalize, then the presumption of liberty is with that. And the presumption of the status quo is saying, you've got to justify that. You've got the burden of proof to say why we should liberal. So there is some tension there to be sure, but they do stand shoulder to shoulder against new restrictions. And I um and and in, so I think there's just that sensibility in Smith. And I also think that, that when you you mentioned the polity conservatism, I think there that he's apprehensive about things that would drastically change the polity. And when I say polity, I don't just mean the institutions of government. I mean the I mean the United States of America, if we're talking about the United States. I mean, the people, the culture, the institutions, the the outlook, just the functioning, the functionality. So, so there's a cautiousness about drastic change, and I think that's very, very important because governments are very dangerous things, and and can fall into tyranny and despotism, um, instability, and you can't you know fly towards radical liberal or can't hope to fly towards radical liberal reform and maintain stable politics i think he felt that way 
and like I say, his friends, I feel that way. Uh, so there is this conservative element um, that is cautious about the really, really great dangers in, in kind of radicalism, you could say. So I think that conservative liberalism is, is a worthy understanding. It's a worthy term, let me say, put it rather, is a worthy term for what I think is a good understanding of the best that classical liberalism has to offer, which means that of all the classical liberals, uh, like the guys I mentioned, but also others, for example, the Thomas Paine or Thomas Jefferson um, or others that, that we could name in the liberal tradition, and I mean the classical liberal tradition, I count them certainly as classical liberals, but I prefer the conservative liberals. And so I think, so conservative liberal, looking back at, is a matter of intellectual history, I would say is a subset of classical liberal and it's the best, so, or the, the best part of classical liberalism is in the conservative liberal space, if you will. Others I would include here, by the way, at least one other that I'd like to mention is de Tocqueville, who I think is super important and still vastly underappreciated. And unfortunately his warnings have been proven all too relevant and prophetic. Um, I'm not sure how long I've spoken, but um, I guess that's a start and shall we proceed? Um, sure. <clears throat> Dear, Dear, you want me to put on the spot and, and build on that? For you want to unmute yourself? Um, yeah, well, I, I agree with Dan in, in so many ways. Um, we do not agree on the uh, on the Christian origin of all this, but that's that's a that's a minor point. They, they I, I I think you're you're right, Dan. That that that, that Tocqueville is undervalued, and that. Um, uh, people like George Will in the contemporary scene are conservative liberals. I once asked George, um, I, I, I challenged him. I said, George, haven't you really become a libertarian? And he said, yeah, yeah, I have. Um, so, but, but of course, the, the, the only problem with the word conservative, as you well know, is that it's um, it, it 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 is used and tends to be inflected with a kind of a uh, Bolsonaro Trump <laughs> version of conservative uh, against queers and against women and against this and against that 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 Edmund Burke if he were to appear um, now. But by the way, there's a statue one block from the Cato Institute in Washington of Edmund Burke. So uh, he would he would agree that Adam Smith's wise um, tendency to uh, not want to overturn institutions. Pain. Tom Paine said. We have the power to make the world again. And that's not Adam Smith. Adam Smith starts from the existing institutions and wants to tweak them, to move them towards a, a presumption of the, the liberal plan of um, equality, liberty, and, and justice. I would cite here, and I think you would agree with me, Hayek's point that he makes about the liberty side of the Enlightenment and the rationality side of the Enlightenment. And, and I think, and he said, that, that the Scots, not just um, Smith, but the Scots in general, in the 18th century and early 19th are, are in favor of the liberty half and that the reason half leads to 
a dangerous radicalism of various sorts, either either conservative or or um, or or or, or so-called progressive. So I I'm very much in favor of a um, what would you call it a, a well you, you're I'm 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 going to sign on um, uh, to your notion of conservative liberalism being very uh, articulate and, <laughs> and insisting on that it doesn't mean um, uh, sending women back to the kitchen or, or uh, anything of that character. So perhaps moderately conservatively liberal. Yeah, that, I appreciate all that. The words, of course, these central significant words, the words we fight over have yeah, yeah. Dif different meanings. Um, there's a word for that, polysemy. They're polysemous. And it's important to bear in mind the different kind of meaning significations that each of these words have and just try to see how they differ and sort them out and see which one you mean and try to figure out what someone means when you hear someone else say the word. Yeah. So I, I agree and we have to we have to be careful. Um, conservative is, is as difficult as liberal, of course. Um, and, and in some ways, conservative, if you just think of it merely as the endorsement of whatever is, is is absurd. And, you know, even all of our traditional conservatives that we admire, like George Will, certainly don't mean that and never have. Yeah. Um, and so anyway, yeah, that, that all sounds, you know, good to me. Um, yeah. Uh, other well, questions? Gonna, oh, go here's, ahead. Here, here's, here's a, here's an, here's, I think an interesting issue, which our, 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 uh, colleagues here are very aware of, which is that because you and I and other conservative liberals are not willing to go to the barricades because we're not radicals in that sense. We're in a sense defenseless against the radicals who are willing to go to the barricades. I'm, I'm involved some in the, well, involved isn't quite the word, but I, I'm commenting in public on the Brazilian ill election. And I'm urging my Brazilian friends in a, in a column I do for the newspaper down there to vote for Lula <laughs> against Bolsonaro. Maybe in the first round for someone else, but in the third round, I mean, the second round that's coming. Help up, us. Who is Lula? He's the, he's the, uh, he's the corrupt socialist who was the president for a long time in, in Brazil, actually went to jail for his corruption. Mm -hmm. But he's better than Bolsonaro, who's a radical conservative. Uh, yeah, I can say, I don't, I don't know, I don't follow well, it. Well, but. but you know, he's, 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 uh, he's the, the uh, Latin Trump is what he is. You know, my general view is that the Republicans are the lesser evil. And to me, Trump is not an exception to that. No, no, I, I completely disagree with you, dear. He's a, we, 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 we should have a, a separate discussion, but I, I, mm -hmm. I think Trump is, is marching towards. So you, 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 you don't have any, you, you're glad that Biden won. Yes. Mm -hmm. I, I even, now, this is a shocking admission, I agree, because for decades, I've only voted libertarian. But in Chicago, where, of course, it doesn't matter, I voted for Biden. I see. Let me um, insert a question here. Um, you mentioned de Tocqueville's warnings that have come true, mm -hmm. Daniel, number one. Mm -hmm. I want to explore that, because uh, I remember, what was it, 20 or 15 years ago, there was a de Tocqueville craze on his Democracy in America book and folks were really into it. Uh, it was, I thought it was cool. And then the next thing, um, <clears throat> on this sort of uh, quibbling on the edges kind of mentality um, and pain, I'm, I'm reminded of Payne's uh, fight with Burke, 
mm-hmm. with his book, uh, The Rights of Man, was it? Mm-hmm. Um, after Burke uh, slammed the French Revolution kind of chaos. Um, you know, Paine was a gifted writer and a communicator. That's why he was so helpful you know, getting our revolution uh, more popular, even among our own people. And it, it seems to me that the presumption for the status quo could be used by those running the status quo as a weapon sure. to marginalize the radicals because the radicals usually are poor and marginalized and easy to, to uh, marginalize. Look at the COVID nonsense like Jeff Tucker and other libertarians who had such a hard time trying to ask basic questions about regulatory capture at the FDA by pharma. I mean, can you really um, exempt pharma from the regulatory capture dynamic that infects all of government? Um, so talk about that. So two questions. Let's get into Tocqueville's warning. So that's, that's an interesting turn of phrase. Uh, and then can the status quo presumption be weaponized against radicals who we may need to get some of these reforms passed? Because, you know, we're in a pretty bad yeah. way with this um, entitlements uh, weighted down government. Yeah, sure. There's a lot there. Um... I'm not sure where to begin. Uh, definitely, let me just speak to weaponizing the status quo. Yeah, that's why liberalism is the noun. It should be liberalism is the noun. You know, the noun's the most substantive thing in an expression, and the conservative just modifies the liberalism. I mean, free speech and letting people disagree, dissent, and, and not weaponizing, uh, you know, is is part of liberalism. Um, so. Yeah, that's we definitely has to be fought at every turn. Um, I agree. It's very important. Uh, you mentioned Jeff Tucker. I'm a huge admirer of Jeff and everything he's done on COVID, the great success of the Great Barrington Dec- Declaration. I wish it was a greater success, but I mean, it was a marvelous thing. So yeah, we definitely need, we need Jeff Tucker's to be sure. Um, and yeah, I mean, politics at the end of the day is a matter of lesser evil. And they tend to weaponize. I mean, whoever's got the weapons tends to, you know, the levers of power, turn them into weapons, um, and some worse than others, in my view. Um, you know, so yeah, we got to try to stay brave and vigilant. It's very, very hard. Now, on the other folks you mentioned, Tocqueville, as well as Payne in relation to Burke, um, I'm more up on Tocqueville and Burke than I am on Payne. On Tocqueville, um, Okay, yeah, no, I've I've been lately reading and writing about uh, democracy in America. I also read his other famous work recently, too. But democracy in America really is a warning. It really is. I mean, and that is definitely the main theme and purpose of it. He's not going, he's not fighting democracy. In fact, he just thinks that democracy is kind of like our fate and where we're at, and we have to make it better rather than worse. Uh, in a kind of pragmatic, if you like, conservative liberal way. Um, And his warnings are actually kind of two-step. First of all, he's warning of a tutelary state, a kind of smothering nanny state that subjects individuals to, you know, kind of coddling and the welfare state and and depriving them of autonomy and independence and dignity um, and all of that. And and there's kind of a model of that, if you like, in in Tocqueville, not a model, but a kind of a, a vision of that where the equality of subjection by the state, by the government is preserved. And as bad as that is, and all that he says, what he says is that that will lead to something even worse. And that is simply despotism and lawless government, where it won't be equality of subjection. It will be rigged elections, it will be abuse, it will be plutocracy, it will be despotism. And so- That's Trump, dear. uh, As well as others. I mean, it's, you know, I mean, take a look what's happening. Um, So, and not just here. um, I mean, look at what Jeff Tucker fought against and who was the worst. Um, So 
so yeah, we've got this very, very, very. I mean, we, 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 you know, we're in danger, real danger of turning into just a lawless kind of lesser developed country, despotic regime. I mean, or polity, if you want. Uh, unfortunately, um, so that warning and that warning is so deep and so brilliant and so moving and so. <sighs> there's some there's like a deep shuddering like i don't know what the right word is now um communication about it that i that i think is really really remarkable so i have this like tremendous admiration and love of tocqueville um yeah um i'll, I'll leave off on burke and Payne uh, for the moment uh let me see if you got if you can react anybody what? I think you said two points. Your first point from democracy in America was uh, the risk of the nanny states and exposing us to yeah. sort of the um, refutalization <laughs> of and yeah. that we that we're seeing now. And I think your earlier answer was spot on. Free speech. A lot of folks are saying the censorship by the narrative gatekeepers is you know the weapon. Um, so if you lose that First Amendment, it really is hard for right. uh, truth tellers and radicals right. to get their message out. Um, was there a, the only thing I remember from that book was his work on associations, uh, yeah, how yeah, private associations mm -hmm. could replace government. Um, I don't remember so much the warning, but that's pretty scary. Yeah, the, the association stuff is about how things are going fairly well in the U.S., um, for a number of reasons, which he talks about, and the associations and kind of localism, bottom up, it's decentralization, you could say spontaneous order aspects, um, is part of, very much part of that. And he's, you know, brilliant on that. And of course, that's exactly what he hopes can be sustained through time and even enhanced through time. But he's got this huge fear, and this is the real point of the book about the growth of centralization, the growth of the governmentalization of social affairs, just like he saw plainly in France happening and goes way back in France as his earlier, or I should say his later book explains. Um, so while he's saying we need to kind of be like America and learn from America, it's all in the service in a way of staving off and to some extent reversing this governmentalization, centralization, smothering that he is warning about. And again, just to kind of clarify, so what he warns of is first of all, a kind of smothering by a tutelary state, kind of a schoolmaster state where it's not totally corrupt. And in some sense, you know, you can do what you want and think what you want and there's reasonable, you know, there's sort of a rule of law in the sense that they do put all of these laws up on their website and obey them, and they're imposed equally. But that all is going to lead to something which is not rule of law, is not equality of subject, subjection, and it's just going to be, and they're going to go after enemy, enemies, they're going to weaponize. They're going to shut down their enemies. They're going to use all of this tutelary, vast, expansive power to fight, you know, to call parents terrorists when they object to left wing crap in the schools. So that's really what he's warning of is, is actually the, 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 the despotism, the coming despotism, which I think, unfortunately, is what's happening right now in the United States. And your colleague in the law school there, Todd Zawicki. Has yeah. done good work on it as well. Yeah. Um, Deirdre, I know you have to go. Do you want to uh, leave a comment? I know you presented a year ago with us on the bourgeoisie, um, which has always been a target of some of the plutocrats. You know, the first thing they do in their revolutions is get rid of the thinkers, right, in the creative class. Yeah, but but but, but I think the 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 kind of thinking that that Dan is doing is more is more fundamental than my my defense of the uh, of the middle class although i'm all in favor of it um i i i would like to us to consider changing the word liberal or 
libertarian in kind of a jokey way to adultism. Because I, 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 I think the problem of long-term French centralization since Colbert and before, on the one hand, and the over-powerful, very big now since uh, the early, since actually since the Second World War, these very big modern states, uh, the, the French state takes 55% of French national income for its purposes. And it's not that much lower, it's 35% here in the United States. That is to make us into children, into subjects. Uh, and, 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 and that's a much longer and more deep problem. The subordination of, of women to men, the subordination of slaves to masters, and now the subordination of us all to the state. And, and, and I have to agree with Dan that Biden is as, as guilty of that as is uh, from the, uh, from a more reactionary side as Trump and Bolsonaro. Charles, I think you mentioned the word feudalism. Was that right? Yeah. I think that's a really interesting way to put it. And it I'm afraid there's a lot to it. It's a good it way is. to think about it. The, the, the government is asserting a, a kind of ownership of the polity, yep. which would be a configuration of ownership, which I think is rejected by classical liberalism and by Smith in particular. Yeah. I think they saw taxation and all these other things as fundamentally the initiation of coercion, not the rules of some big club or yeah. hotel like Club USA. Yeah. So and then when the government, you know, assumes uh, this kind of attitude and treats the country, uh, the polity is sort of it's as a, a, a property in a way which you are a tenant of. So you're like a tenant now, and if you don't like it, you're free to leave. Um, it, 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 and then it grows all of this apparatus, governmentalization of social affairs, you know, growing all the public sector and controlling everything in the private sector. It's, it's a lot like a feudalism. Or, 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 or to take a modern case, uh, the mafia, which is a reinvention of feudalism. Yeah. Um, I suppose so. Um, it's just that it's out in the open in a way that the mafia hasn't always been. I mean, uh, so it's, I mean, that's the difference between the mafia and the government. <laughs> it's one of the differences is that they, they, they pretend to have it all up on the website and tell you just how much they're going to take and yes. even act like it's like socially justified by the, by the larger community. So there is a difference between the government and others who make their living by the initiation of force. I agree. Um, so we're all serfs in this kind of uh, yeah. progression. And this is, of course, what Hayek was worried about. He was also like a Tocqueville warning us of the road to serfdom. He has, a, he has by the way, an essay in 1956 or 55, something like that, which is much clearer on the point because he, 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 he says then that it's a psychological serfdom. Well, I don't think he would confine it to that, but no, I, no, I, 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 I understand that. But, but that is easier to persuade our friends on the left about, or maybe it's impossible. But in any case, yeah, we should try. We should try. Well, I guess to Edward Bernays' uh, teachings on propaganda as a tool of the state, more effective than violence and war. Yep. And the mass form psychosis that has been going around the past few years. Yeah. Um, you know, Dr. Uh, McCloskey, I know you have to leave um, yeah, and, uh, you know, stay as long as you want, of course. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a privilege. I think this is, a, this is an important conversation. I think we all know how difficult the classics are for the lay person, let alone students. Um, and it's a constant battle among you professors, how you make it easier, I think, your popular books, Jirder, like uh, the Bourgeois series, 
Uh, well, those weren't very popular, I have to say. I have, well, a, I have, a, I have a more po popular book with Art Carden. It's called Leave Me Alone and I'll Make You Rich. <laughs> yeah, um, that was uh, in the works with uh, Art when you presented here a year ago. We'll have but, to have you and Art back on. It's all um, done. It's, 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 it's published by Chicago. But, you know, um, Dan's doing the the hard the hard work here. No, uh, Deirdre's doing the hard work. Deirdre's We're all doing the hard work. work. Deirdre's it's hard work. We labor. Yeah. We have we have a labor yeah. theory of value. Uh, Deirdre, <laughs> I, I mean, let me just say, just from a yeah. just from a uh, even just a casual observer's acquaintance with all of this, Deirdre has you know created the emblem, which is the great you know, result and, and blessing of this whole liberal era that, you know, came out of Smith and everyone. And that's the vast increase in wealth. And that's the expression, the great enrichment. Yeah. That's like all part of the, all yeah. part of like well, the I'm, arc. It's like, the, it's like part of the fruit of the arc. And I'm currently working on a book, um, which will, uh, you know, I'm, I'm almost finished with called God and Mammon, which is an, an attempt to speak to theologians and pastors um, uh, to claim that it's not just a material enrichment. It also can be, and to often to, to is, a spiritual in, 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 in enrichment. Yes, indeed. And that's the inverse or the, yeah, of what Tocqueville is warring about the spiritual em impoverishment. That's right. Of what he's warning against. That's right. Well, of course, he was a Catholic, mm -hmm. and this is serious one, I think. Well, I have to go, dears. Okay. Ciao, ciao. Thanks, Thanks for being with us. And Dan, going back before to Tocqueville, I would imagine this mm -hmm. spiritual element is big with Smith and his moral sentiments, because uh, it's about a benevolence, uh, yes. not just a cold calculation. And uh, talk yes, about that a bit. Okay, sure. The um, generous heart of man. <laughs> okay, um, yes. Um, he, sentiment is very central, obviously, to Smith. Moral sentiment means sentiments about human conduct. The beauty of human conduct make them moral sentiments. I mean, they're not necessarily good moral sentiments, but it's just like it, a moral sentiment is a sentiment about someone's conduct, about whether you find it beautiful. And he go so far as to sort of suppose or presuppose that whenever you have any kind of moral sentiment, there's actually a kind of sympathy involved or a sympathy that it pertains to. A sympathy is kind of lurking in any moral judgment, which is a pretty remarkable thing to try to sustain because a lot of time you're just in your room alone having moral sentiments, thinking about something, watching a TV, you could have moral sentiments about characters in the movie, uh, of course. And so if you're alone, where's the sympathy? Well, it's that you are carrying around, first of all, fellows, the man within your breast, which is what he calls your conscience, the man within your breast. And the sentiment that you have in the moment is one thing, and then there's sort of the maybe a deeper sense and maybe a lingering thing, or, and even a response from your conscience about which also has a sentiment, and it's an agreement or sameness of the sen two sentiments by these two beings that would be sympathy. Um, and so he sustains this sympathy principle, that is to say there's a sympathy lurking in every moral sentiment, by basically bringing other beings present, you know, if there's not another actual other human being in the room with you. And that's the conscience. The conscience itself is made up of different exemplars and influences from your life, like mom and dad in particular, but like others that are around you and influence you, like teachers, authors, preachers, whoever else are kind of all kind of go into your composite, which he calls the man within the breast. Now, the man within the breast itself is a representative of a universal beholder, which you can think of as God. 
uh, he makes this explicit. Um, and so it does. So the idea about your conscience being a kind of related to God, a kind of imago day ideas also in Smith, he, he does that. So his ethics are very much either theistic or paralleled, or, or I should say patterned in parallel, patterned after a benevolent monotheistic view. Okay, after, patterned after benevolent monotheism like Christianity. So yes, it's all about that, and 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 this is so fundamental to, to human beings. He kind of think that thinks that life is principally about moral sentiments, because whatever it is you're doing, you know, even if you're by yourself, even if you're just out in the wilderness on a hike looking at the landscape, you have not just the landscape to estimate to have sentiments about a moment later you have the sentiment you that you just had had to think about so you always are keeping yourself company you always have moral or human conduct to observe because your man within the breast is always watching you so you always have that to turn into an object for estimation, even if you're alone. So we're just deeply social in Smith and moral. And he makes it clear that our kind of moral well being is primary. Of course, there's a necessity of a basic material well being and survival and health. He says that what can be added to the happiness of man who is out of debt, in good health, and has a clear conscience. So what he's saying is out of debt, good health. And then what's important is your conscience. What can be happy, added to the happiness of man who is out of debt in good health and has a clear conscience? That kind of captures a lot about Smith's idea of human well being. That's beautiful. Did I read, um, Dan, um, in some essay years ago? I found this fascinating that you could use this thought from Smith to justify a smaller government. And that is on your comment about one pursues interest uh, upon this plane of justice and liberty, um, that even a bad person has interests that conform him to the societal good, which I found kind of fascinating if true. Have you explored that? A lot of folks probably wouldn't believe that if they heard it, but I think he wrote that in some way, you know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I think he did say things that imply that. I don't think he's saying that it, in every case, uh, does it so for all bad interests. Uh, but for a great many, it makes perfect sense that, let's say it's greed, lethargy, gluttony. And, you know, Samuel Johnson said, there's nothing as innocent as making money. I mean, there's worse things that greedy people can do than try to satisfy, gratify their greed by, you know, making stationary or, you know, whatever they might have been making in Samuel Johnson's day, um, you know, um, to make money in honest income by honest trading. The, in, the interest may not be in terms of what the guy does with his wealth may not be very admirable, may even be um, blameworthy. I mean, just in terms of, you know, squandering it, wasting it on stupid things, not developing himself. Um, <clears throat> and, but, you know, it could be worse. I mean, that if he's just going to learn about it by making money. Um, so I, that's the beauty of the marketplace is that to get somebody, to get someone's money, you've got to get them to uh, buy your good on a voluntary basis. Um, and so you're serving other people in the pursuit of gain. So that, that, that in a way, you know, creates benefits, obviously creates benefits um, from greed and other, you know, you know, la la other lacks of virtue, other things that keep you from being more virtuous than you might be. But of course, if someone has really bad interests, um, the liberal plan doesn't of itself particularly um, um, defuse that. Uh, if someone is violent or you know just horrible, 
plans or designs on other on harming other people. I would say this though, the liberal plan reduces the governmentalization of social affairs and in that way reduces some of the most potentially dangerous <clears throat> levers and powers that could harm people, right? I mean, if we if we have a strong liberal sensibility and we're very suspicious of government and kind of try to keep it on a short leash, then evil people taking seizing the reins of these powerful tools, uh, you know, there's less damage to be done, right? Yeah. Um, uh, switching gears behind you is a painting or a photo. Yeah. Is that Adam Smith with a uh, human? somebody it's not it's not it's um <laughs> let's see if i can i can i think i can do this uh, since you ask <laughs> it's actually three images of the same man and the, the someone described this man uh, and this painting as the portrait of a doomed man that's charles the first who was oh, beheaded what? who was beheaded, I think it's 1649, you know, in the English Civil War. Uh, that's Charles Stewart, the first. Yeah, I live here near Jamestown. So it's pretty cool here to think about Jamestown, the settlement in the 1600s. Yeah. With different governors or different ruling authorities, whether it's all over Cromwell's governments or Charles and James and all them. Um, so we're, we're coming down to the final uh, part of this. Um, you're really focused on Adam Smith and some of the philosophers around that time as an econ professor. Um, how did you kind of get pigeonholed in this role, or is it something that you think is your place to be sort of the teacher for, because you can't have an econ education without this enlightenment um, fundamental teaching? Um, it's a good question, but off the, offhand, I think I'd say this. I worked my way back in time. Um, like I started with the people around me, such as Rothbard, Hazlitt, um, Hayek, Mises, Friedman, and others, and you know, knew people who knew people who knew them in person and all of that good stuff. I went to NYU, so I knew Israel Kirstner, I know Israel Kirstner, and all that. The libertarian movement generally I come out of New York area originally and then California. And um, you know, I just, I mean, this sounds a little, you know, conceited, but I guess I in searching higher, I found I had to go back in time. And I do think that the best of the 18th century is better than the best of the 20th century. Wow. So to some extent, it's just like, look, you want to do your philosophy and conversation with thinkers. I mean, that's just how we connect. It's the formulations we use or play off of. It's what we refer to. It's ev if we, even if it's about a foil as opposed to an exemplar, we kind of relate to each other through these cultural figures, these towering paramount cultural figures. And I find you know, particularly Hume and Smith. I'm very, I, I really love Burke, but you got to understand that Burke is a different kind of player to a large extent. He's a pol he's an actual politician, an actual statesman for the most of his career. Uh, and and it, 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 he, he's not as much the man of speculation as the other two guys. Um, although he did do some certainly along those lines, but, um, but, but he's a different kind of player. So that that's, I kind of, I, I liked, and then like Tocqueville, I just like, like him so much. I think he's so profound and deep. Um, I like Hayek. I think is my favorite of the 20th century. I don't know. Does that make sense? Uh, it does definitely. Um, you know, when you go down the, when you go down a rabbit hole of your, thinking in your life path you're going to explore and find new um influencers for your conscience the, the men within your heart within your breast yeah um i've been reading c.s lewis lately and 
I, I don't, you know, I don't know how I would put them relative to Hayek or something because it's so different. But um, I'm very, very impressed with C.S. Lewis. Well, um, David Thoreau presented C.S. Lewis a year or two ago. I've had a lot of pretty cool presenters over the years. Um, you mentioned Rothbard and Hayek, and I saw a little uh, tension there uh, on the Trump uh, example. Uh, I find Trump to be a good friction point for deep thinkers these days, because for a lot of us, it's not just about Trump. It's about what kind of middle finger can you insert into the uh, deep state to gum the works, to cause chaos, to allow for some of the liberal reforms. Um, and so that was pretty cool. And I, it's Unruh much more I, my, my what I said about Trump. I, look, I, I I don't know what my exact assessment of Trump would look like. I think it's I don't know. I haven't stu I haven't actually tried enough. I wouldn't know or even know. But I do. The most basic thing is I think there's a huge difference between the Republicans and the Democrats. And even if Trump is a a, a bad Republican among Republicans, I still don't think it overcomes that basic difference at all. So it's not that I'm, you know, I just don't think Trump is an exception to Republicans being a lesser, the lesser evil. And yeah. I think it's crazy. I think it's crazy to suggest that Biden is a lesser evil. Well, you know, there are plenty of beltwaytarians who do think that way. Um, I know, well, the beltway is the beltway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you're almost in it with the GMU thing, but almost. Guys, I'm just outside the Beltway. Actually. And uh, Todd Zawicki, a, 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 I like him too. Um, yeah. You mentioned Rothbard, and Rothbard to me is the guy. And that's a dangerous thing to say for a lot of libertarians and economic right wing pre market professors because, you know, there's a lot of arguments uh, on that guy. Um, he wrote History of Economic Thought, which to me was just a brilliant history. A lot of folks argue he was mistaken here and there. But to go from Aristotle to uh, to uh, Marx in such a such a nicely written way, it's it's like I said about Professor White saving Adam Smith. It's an easy way to get in, to get an introduction on complex authors from the past that you won't read their original sources because it's too complex. What did what did you think about history history of economic thought? Did you read it or do you know about it? Of course, I've read fair amounts of it, the two volumes. Um... I started with Rothbard too, among others. Um, and I just would say like, it's not necessarily a bad place to start, but I don't think it's a great place to finish. <laughs> um, so I think I think Rothbard has, has his limitations and problems um, to be sure. And, uh, and I've criticized him some openly, you know, in print. Um, uh, the history of thought stuff, what he says about Adam Smith, I have a lot of quarrels with, as a matter of fact. Um, so I have mixed feelings about Rothbard. As to so many. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, I think for people like me and maybe you and others, I'm a very open-minded person. I just want liberty. And I think a lot of sages throughout the past and in different cultures too, you can Google liberty in the, in the Vedas or even Lao Tzu, you know, Taoism. There, there's a lot of various libertarian thought throughout history said in different ways. Yeah. And you can always project your own views on someone and misinterpret them, uh, which a more focused person like you will say, yeah, and that's not quite right. Uh, yeah, Rothbard did kind of project, I think, a lot on a lot of people forcing his filter on them. Um, and that, that turned off a lot of uh, high level thinkers to what his approach, because he's def definitely polemic. Um, so let's wrap it up here. Dan, uh, give us your final thought on Anna Smith as an invitation for, for folks to explore more. Tell them, how, tell folks how they can reach you or what they should read to catch up. Um, yeah. Unless sure. Jim, do have, Jim, do you have a final question? Yeah, go for it, Dan. Um, yeah, Adam Smith. Um, I do think it's really worth trying to dip into Adam Smith and hear his own words. 
Um, it's a little bit of the, it's difficult, frankly. Um, the the wealth of nations is certainly easier to read and to understand, just chapter by chapter, paragraph by paragraph. What's going on in the theory of moral sentiments is more complicated. Um, you might go to the wisdom of Adam Smith. It's a selections book put out by Liberty Fund. Benjamin Rogi is the editor it's from years ago. And I think it's a very nice get acquainted book. He's also got a lot of quotes from the theory of moral sentiments, which I think work pretty well, stand alone. So the wisdom of Adam Smith, it's got a red cover and I've used it in my teaching and I think it's a very good, um, maybe first initiation to Adam Smith. And how do folks reach you and see your work? Oh, you could just Google Dan Klein, George Mason University, and, and you'll find me. Um, what a coincidence. Ben Rogge taught at Wabash College, where my dad went uh -huh. um, back in the late 50s. He knew him. And Rogge has another book uh, on a general liberty book I have somewhere in my... Can Capitalism location. Survive? Yes. Yeah. I don't remember what he says in that. I have it. I think he says, I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Dan. Um, this thank is you. Fun, fundamental stuff for an American. I remember getting my master's to teach and learning about the history of education and that, you know, our the, the, the population in our founding times was smarter than we give them credit for. Ditch diggers were speaking philosophy was one quote. Um, we do need to explore the deep thinkers because this is a country built on deep thought. Um, so thanks, Dan, for what you do, and I enjoy. Let, me, let me just let me just point out on that thought. You got to realize that our founding fathers are, are are in some sense Brits, and so when you say it's built on deep thought, you should be thinking about Hume and Smith and Burke very much. Hey, Dan, how yeah. can people reach you or follow you? Look at your work. Just go to my webpage, I guess. Just again, just Google Dan Klein, George Mason University Economics, and it's, you know, you'll find me. And that webpage, or do you want to list the other one, the Adam Smith page? Adam Smith Works at Liberty Fund? Uh, sure. I mean, that's a great resource. Uh, it's not just me. I mean, I've got pieces up there, but uh, it's huge. Uh, so that would be worth looking at too. So what about your wealth? If your money could actually talk to you, would you listen to it? Well, with the DNA Network Academy, your money actually can talk to you. And it's going to tell you just what it told this client. This family had over 24 debts, mortgages, car loans, the works. They were on track to take 20 years to pay it all off and instead did it in 8.5. Plus, they did it without refinancing, making more money, or even changing their lifestyle. So find out for yourself with a free analysis that is completely confidential. No personal information, no social security numbers, no credit checks, none of that nonsense. But what is exciting is that the outcome of that report you receive is a guaranteed outcome for you. To get that report, head on over to bit.ly forward slash debt to wealth. You will arrive at this simple form, fill it in, as simple as lender number one and credit card number two, what really matters is the accuracy of your numbers. You'll be able to see that if instead of 20 years or whatever your number is, that you may actually be out of debt and on your way to wealth in as little as 6.3 years like this client. 